Hey guys, today I'll show you a fantasy horror TV series named The Witcher Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins on a snowy and windy night when a Ferrari carriage slowly enters a small town that is unusually quiet with not a single light shining. Three merchants, seeking lodging, were suddenly attacked, dying without ever seeing what killed them. The story continues from the previous season where the war between the Northern Kingdoms and the Nilfgaardian Empire has ended. The Northern Kingdoms lost 9,000 soldiers, while Nilfgaard lost at least 20,000. By casualty numbers, the Northern Kingdoms won, but Tissaia, the one in charge of Aratusa Academy, felt no joy. She collected memories from dying soldiers, hoping to find Yennefer's whereabouts, but to no avail. The sorcerer named Vilgo, seeing her effort fruitless, urged her to accept the reality that her sorceress student Yennefer might be dead. Elsewhere, the witcher Geralt finally met up with his child of destiny, Ciri, at the old man's farm, and they were now also searching for Yennefer. The news of Yennefer's death left Geralt in grief, prompting him to leave. After all, she was his former lover. At night, he told Ciri everything he knew about the Sintra kingdom, including the law of surprise and how Ciri came to be his child of destiny. However, the truth about destiny still needed to be explored. Geralt planned to go to Kaer Morhen, the Witcher's winter refuge, to rest, change armor, and replenish potions. It's clearly a Witcher's supply point. Passing by the small town where the three merchants were killed previously, which remained eerie without guards or barking dogs, Geralt decided not to enter, and instead went to a friend's house nearby. He was attacked upon entering, but held back when the attacker shouted his name. It turned out to be his old friend, Nivellen, whom Geralt had helped his father slay a dragon in the past. Nivellen had the power to wish for things to happen. He called for a bath, and then a bathtub appeared. Ciri excitedly ran to it and couldn't wait to bathe after they left. Assured of absolute safety by Nivellen, Geralt followed him to another room to chat, unaware that a pair of peeping eyes were spying on Ciri through a hole in the roof. After bathing, they went to the dining room where Nivellen served them delicious food and shared his story of why he became a beast. He had eaten hallucinogenic mushrooms and destroyed the lion-headed spider temple, so the priestess cursed him into such a beast to live forever with his disfigurement in solitude. When discussing why the town below was deserted, Nivellen blamed it on the Battle of Sodden, the last war between the Northern Kingdoms and Nilfgaard. Suddenly there was noise from the roof. Nivellen said it was his cat, but Geralt frowned, saying that the curse on him meant he should have no living pets as his companion. Nivellen hastily changed the subject and performed a shadow play for Ciri with magic, telling a story of elf and human love. Reminded of the mage Mouse Sack who had died to protect her escape, Ciri wished she could go back in time to save him. Touched by Ciri's genuine emotion, Nivellen also shared his experience of trying to attract girls with treasures, hoping for words of true love to break the curse, but to no avail. He remained an ugly monster. The true horror of monsters lies not in their appearance or sharp claws, but in the deeds they commit. In the yard, Geralt discovered a set of footprints leading to the nearby town. Returning to the room, he suggested a knife-throwing game to Nivellen. The one who misses the target has to drink and must share a heartfelt truth. Under Nivellen's magical influence, Geralt repeatedly missed the target and confessed that Yennefer had touched his heart. Witchers aren't emotionless. Feigning indifference was just a means to fool common folk. Taking advantage of Nivellen's smugness, Geralt produced his own knife and finally hit the target. He had long realized his old friend was cheating, but that wasn't important. What mattered was what had happened to him. Regrettably, Nivellen still couldn't reveal the whole truth. After Ciri had fallen sound asleep and snoring like a pig in her bedroom, the so-called cat on the roof appeared. It was a girl in white. The cat girl approached Ciri's bedside, waking up the piggy. The girl claimed to be Nivellen's friend, and she felt a kinship due to the ancient blood flowing in Ciri's veins and showed no hostility. Instead, she kissed Ciri's hand to help her sleep soundly. After Nivellen rested, Geralt followed the footprints to their end, deducing that Abruxa was at hand, which is a powerful type of vampire that takes on human appearance, but whose natural form is that of a large bat with fangs and claws. He quickly woke Ciri, urging her to escape on horseback while he prepared for battle with a dose of Witcher's Potion. Upon reaching Nivellen's room, he saw the Bruxa feasting on his diabetic blood. Bursting through the door, Geralt was knocked back by the Bruxa's sonic scream. Following her to the corridor, he repelled her with a magical sign. In the courtyard, the Bruxa attacked again with her chicken scream, but this time Geralt deflected it with his sign. The Bruxa shifted to her second form and took to the sky, attempting to outmaneuver Geralt, but to no avail. Geralt thrust his sword, returning her to her true and naked form. 
Seeing that, Ciri rushed forward, draping her cloak over the Bruxa's sexy body in order to stop Geralt's peeping. But the creature seized the opportunity to take her hostage, demanding Geralt let her go, reasoning that she still had many grandmas to care for. During the standoff, Nivellen suddenly appeared, stabbing the Bruxa in the chest. But such a wound was trivial to her. As she turned to approach Nivellen, Geralt beheaded her, causing Nivellen to suddenly revert to his handsome human form. The curse was lifted, but Nivellen was far from happy. It turns out he had rescued the dying Bruxa in the woods. She didn't fear his monstrous appearance. To keep her alive to be his companion, he willingly offered his diabetic blood, given his ability to revive endlessly. But the Bruxa couldn't control her instincts and slaughtered the townspeople, including the three merchants as shown at the beginning. Geralt couldn't overlook this. Nivellen was cursed with love and blood, not because he defiled the temple, but because he raped the priestess. The curse on him would be broken by losing his true love, the Bruxa. However, this wasn't the outcome he wanted. Now, whether to end his life or continue living, Geralt left that choice to Nivellen himself. Leaving the castle, Ciri, with tears in her eyes, told Geralt that she felt like a harbinger of disaster. Everywhere she went, death seemed to follow. The poor girl thinking of herself as a calamity, but in reality, she's the main character with a halo of protagonist's luck. Geralt had to comfort her and reassured her no need to panic. After resting for the night, the pair finally arrived at the Witcher's Refuge and a safe place for Ciri. When Geralt had last left, there were twenty Witchers. Now, perhaps there were even fewer. As they opened the door, the Witchers inside immediately stood up to welcome them. Their bond was like that of brothers, with the leader Vesemir playing the role of a father figure. It was Ciri's first time seeing Geralt interact so warmly with others, his face full of genuine smiles. They all sat together, drinking and boasting, sharing stories of their adventures before returning home. However, a sudden loud shout interrupted everyone. Geralt stood up with a smile to greet the newcomer. It's a witcher named Eskel, who had also returned, proudly carrying the arm of a tree-like creature native to woodlands. Eskel boasted that after a six-hour fight, he almost had the creature. But Vesemir poured cold water on his pride, reminding him that piercing the heart with fire was the only way to kill it. He further teased Eskel, asking if it really took him six hours to remember that, causing Eskel's face to turn red. During some downtime, Vesemir found Geralt practicing with his sword against a wooden post and spoke to him about Ciri, the child of destiny due to the law of surprise. They had both agreed to abandon the child years ago, but fate had other plans and Geralt had no choice but to protect her. Vesemir expressed his concerns about the Witchers getting tangled up with human kingdoms, worrying it may not end well. Back in their room, Geralt informed Ciri that the tree monsters cannot reproduce. The ones they were encountering were definitely from the conjunction of the spheres. Their bodies could be used as ingredients for making Witcher potions. As they chatted, the noise from the hall grew loud. Geralt left Ciri in the room and went to investigate. It turned out that a group of witchers was throwing a wild party with people Eskel had brought from down the mountain. Prostitutes had been brought to the witchers' stronghold, a practice with which Geralt was not pleased. Eskel, looking irritated, dismissed his bullshit by saying that he even brought back a princess to care for. The conversation grew more heated and envious, almost leading to a fight which Geralt easily diffused. There was no need for further words. Geralt walked away, while Eskel took the women to perform some hormone yoga in other rooms. Vesemir, noticing that Ciri was still awake, decided to tell her about the first group of witchers and their deeds. They had once cornered one of the oldest monsters deep in the forest and killed it. It's said that the demon still calls out to the unfortunate souls who wander into her forest, luring them in only to devour their smelly parts. In the room next door, Eskel was in a rush to indulge in pleasures with a call girl. Suddenly, a tree vine began to emerge from the wound in his back. It's a wound inflicted by a tree monster. Inside the hall, all the witcher's medallions started to quiver, a clear sign that trouble was brewing. Each witcher sprang into action. Some escorted the call girls to safety, others went to check the watchtowers. Geralt had just gone to find Ciri when Vesemir intercepted him. The priority now was to stay and fight. All witchers prepared for battle, but it was Geralt who first noticed something amiss. The woman with Eskel lay dead, and Eskel himself had been possessed by the tree monster, launching attack after attack on Geralt. It was only when Geralt used a torch to drive him back that he could see Eskel's face, but this also cost him the chance to subdue his friend. The tables turned in an instant, and just as Geralt was about to be overwhelmed, Vesemir appeared and repelled the attacker. 
Seeing the creature attempting to flee, the master and apprentice sealed the door and shackled it with chains, hoping to save Eskel. However, the tree monster seized the opportunity to control Vesemir with its vines, nearly strangling him. Geralt, fighting through his grief, imbued his sword with a fire spell and drove it straight into the monster's heart. Eskel, now one with the monster, also perished from the deadly blow. Vesemir removed his medallion. The witchers were now one fewer. After the battle, Geralt immediately found Ciri, embraced her to ensure her safety, and then led her to the hall where everyone laid down their weapons. Vesemir poured strong liquor for everyone, toasting to Eskel's memory. Now, only eleven of the Wolf School witchers remained. Geralt handed Ciri a wooden sword. Her training had to begin if she was to survive. The scene shifts to the Northern Kingdom's alliance, where the war wounded were being treated and cared for. The sorceress Triss was badly burned by fire, suddenly convulsing as if she were on the brink of death. Tissaia urgently recited an ancient spell to soothe her before moving to the interrogation room. The Alliance had captured an important prisoner, the Black Knight who was the leader of the intruding Nilfgaardian army. Standard interrogation techniques were useless against him, so Tissaia resorted to forbidden magic, plunging her hands into the Knight's head to extract his consciousness and memories. Her brutality was a direct consequence of Yennefer's disappearance. However, Yennefer was not dead, but had been captured by her sorceress classmate Fringilla, who was now serving the enemy Nilfgaard instead. Despite the defeat at Sodden Hill, Fringilla had not lost her spirit and still planned to return to the Empire for a comeback. The two women exchanged taunts, neither willing to back down. After a brief respite, they were about to continue their journey when their soldiers were suddenly massacred in an unexpected attack, leaving them without a chance to fight back. In the blink of an eye, only Yennefer and Fringilla remained, and they were swiftly taken away in a carriage. During the journey, Yennefer dreamed of having a child with Geralt, but the baby was snatched away by a figure in red robes. Fringilla awoke from a similar nightmare, her wrists shackled with dimeridium cuffs like Yennefer's. Only then did they realize they were both captives. Their captor was none other than the elven king Philovandril, who had appeared in the first season. They were to be gifts for his wife, Francesca, in the elven tower built to commemorate their prophetess. Fringilla tried to threaten the elves with Nilfgaard's power, but Francesca merely flicked her wrist and Fringilla fainted. Yennefer, who understood the ancient language and had one-quarter elven blood, was not recognized by Francesca as one of her people. It was clear that Francesca was now the dominant force among the elves. The two sorceresses, trapped in their cell, discussed the nightmares they had in the carriage. Yennefer's involved a man in red robes, while Fringilla's involved a man in black. Yennefer recalled that while in the prisoner camp earlier, she heard Francesca had dreamt of a man in white robes, whom she believed to be Elves' sacred prophetess, guiding the Elves to a safe harbor. Yennefer realized that such dreams were a powerful omen that could be used to gain the trust of the Elves. So Yennefer found an opportunity to converse with the Elven King Philovandril. She learned that after his failed campaign against their enemy, the elf race turned to his wife Francesca for leadership. Fringilla seized the chance to propose a collaboration to uncover the secrets of their dreams. As they spoke, the elves unearthed something in the forest. Francesca's brother then led the two women into a cave where an altar with a three-headed skull was laid out. Francesca's dreams were guided by the prophetess, while Fringilla saw the Nilfgaardian emperor Emir. The content of their dreams fulfilled their desires. Yennefer deduced from the ancient language inscriptions on the altar that the three-headed skull represented the Deathless Mother. The figures in black, white, and red robes from their dreams were probably its incarnations. Suddenly, the altar at the feet of the Deathless Mother shifted, revealing a hidden passage. Francesca led the way inside, and they came upon a small hut without doors, just as described in the inscriptions before the altar. Francesca uttered a spell, and the hut seemed to come alive, turning around. After a moment of disorientation, the figures from their dreams appeared before each of them. It was more a manifestation of their inner demons than their desires, revealing what they truly wanted. It turns out, Fringilla and Francesca shared similar ambitions, one to expand and strengthen the Nilfgaardian Empire, and the other to bring glory to the elves once more. The advice from the Deathless Mother was for them to form an alliance. Satisfied with the two sorceresses for their finding of the Deathless Mother, Francesca decided not to trouble them further. Fringilla set out to accompany Francesca on behalf of Nilfgaard. However, Yennefer did not trust the so-called Deathless Mother and wished to put an end to this absurd affair as soon as possible. Unfortunately, she could not change the situation at hand. 
On the other side, Ciri was undergoing Witcher training in the Witcher Refuge. Her willpower was strong, but she could not change the physical limitations of her body. Geralt did not want her to rush her training, so he forced her to rest. During their argument, Ciri had a vision of the future, but did not tell Geralt what it was. Even a princess has her rebellious moments. Not all within the Witcher community accepted Ciri, like Vesemir's sorcerer trainee, who blamed Geralt for bringing Ciri into their lives, correlating it with Eskel's death. Geralt believed that harboring resentment was pointless. Finding the killer responsible for Eskel's death was what mattered. Mentioning Eskel brought grief to Geralt. They had been the best of brothers, training together and seeking joy together, yet it was Geralt who had to end his life while he was possessed by the creature. Vesemir was at that moment dissecting a body, trying to determine how the tree monster had mutated Eskel. The laboratory was filled with all sorts of alchemical potions potent enough to turn day into night. But frustratingly, he couldn't figure out the damn cause of the mutation. With no other recourse, they could only bury the body and hope for Eskel to find peace sooner rather than later. The two brothers carried Eskel's body to the mountainside, and after the wolves arrived, they left solemnly, letting nature reclaim the Witcher as was fitting. Ciri's training continued unabated. The trainee sorcerer used reverse psychology to coax Ciri into the Witcher's specialized training grounds. The obstacle course was perilous, especially for a human girl. A moment's inattention could result in serious injury. Predictably, Ciri struggled with the first challenge, getting flung by the pendulum repeatedly. But she showed no sign of quitting. Defeat after defeat, she persevered until she finally timed it right and got through, earning the trainee sorcerer's respect. The second stage was even tougher, slicing deep into Ciri's arm in an instant, but the blood and pain did not subdue her. Her relentless determination drew a crowd of witchers, with the trainee sorcerer's jeers turning to shouts of encouragement. She conquered the second stage and, filled with momentum, aimed to clear the subsequent ones. Unfortunately, she stumbled just shy of victory and fell from the platform. Back at the base, Geralt tended to the stubborn princess's wounds. He wanted her to progress steadily. Courage was good, but it needed to be paired with wisdom. Yet Ciri only wanted to act the bruiser and stormed off, leaving Geralt sighing. As he was about to stand, he noticed something peculiar on the wall. Rushing over, he pulled a scarf from the gap in the wall, which belonged to Queen Calanthe, who left it for Ciri. From the gap, there were traces of a monster's presence. It seemed something was targeting Ciri. Geralt quickly caught up with her, asking her to describe what she saw. Ciri couldn't articulate it, only managing to tell Geralt that something wanted to draw her into the forest. So switching from defense to offense, Geralt led Ciri into the woods, following her instincts. They soon found a tree monster with an arm torn off, the very one that took Eskel. Without a word, Geralt struck it down, his sword freshly enchanted. But then, a myriapod monster appeared behind the tree monster and effortlessly killed it. With the enchantment switched, the sword lost its suppressive power and the myriapod chased Ciri to the foot of the mountain. As it was about to abduct her, Geralt arrived in the nick of time, his skillful combination of moves beheading the creature. It didn't seem like the myriapod had intended to kill Ciri, but that was no reason for complacency. To enhance Ciri's self-defense capabilities, Geralt arranged for her a more rigorous special training. During the training, she accidentally fell and got injured. It was then that Triss, who was on her way to the Witcher Refuge, arrived at the scene. The sorceress cast a spell and healed Ciri's wounds. Shortly thereafter, Geralt appeared, carrying his latest prey, and brought Triss back to their base. The Witchers were all delighted to see her as she was an old acquaintance. At the dinner, Triss brought up how she and Geralt first met during the first season where they worked together to save a village from a vampiric striga. Triss also mentioned that she owed Geralt her life. She was invited over this time to help teach Ciri. After some conversation, Geralt showed Triss the severed head of the centipede monster, a species unknown on the continent, which seemed to have been after Ciri. Triss took a piece of the monster's flesh and placed it into a magic bottle. Then she recited an incantation. She said, if the monster was created by a sorcerer, the ingredients inside would glow. They would know the result by the following morning. After handling the matter at hand, Triss expressed a desire for Geralt to stay with her. Unfortunately, Geralt was not in the mood for happiness, so the fishy moments the audience wanted to see did not unfold. 
The following morning, the witchers were teasing Siri again, which Triss would not stand for. She scolded them loudly, saying that the young girl had been washing their rough socks, yet they gave her nothing in return. No clothes, no soap, not even sanitary cloths. Moreover, eating their mushrooms would soon stop her menstruations. She berated them for joking around shamelessly and shooed their smelly ash all away. After leading Siri to the lab, the magic bottle showed no glow, indicating the monster wasn't man-made. However, they found sterite in the sample, a material from the megaliths. The centipede monster's body also contained this material, proving the monsters were from the megaliths. When Siri touched the sterite, she fainted. The scene shifted to another world where Siri, eyes vacant, muttered some inexplicable words. When she awoke, she recalled toppling the megalith during the fall of Sintra in order to stop the Black Knight, realizing that she herself caused the monster invasion, which indirectly led to Eskel's death. Geralt quickly dismissed this notion, saying that everyone has their fate and everything is predetermined. He then returned to his room to prepare his weapons and investigate the fallen megalith. Triss came with a potion and greeted him, and Geralt took the opportunity to apologize for the previous night. He felt he wasn't worthy of Triss, but she insisted he was the one she wanted, the only one with muscles who made her feel anything. However, Vesemir interrupted the fishy moment, not wanting Geralt to venture to the megalith again, but he couldn't dissuade him. Triss had a friend who studied megaliths and could teleport Geralt there. The friend turned out to be Istred. With Geralt gone, Vesemir walked into the forest and found where Ciri had bled, which was now sprouting a clump of sunflowers. This plant only grows where ancient blood is spilled, and ancient blood is a key ingredient in the mutagen that created the first witchers. The old man was overwhelmed with excitement, believing Ciri to be a gift from destiny that could enable their community to create more witchers, a viewpoint that would likely conflict with Geralt's. The scene shifts to Tisaya, who has returned to Aratuza and is currently recording the names of the sorceresses that perished in the Battle of Sodden. The last name she writes down is Yennefer's. Tisaya's hand trembles slightly. Yennefer's supposed death is something she can't seem to come to terms with. The victory at the battle bolstering Vilgo's influence within the Brotherhood, but Tisaya is regretful. She's been unable to extract much information from the Black Knight's mind, failing to break through the magical barriers protecting his thoughts. Stregobor raises a grave concern, saying that elves are flocking to Sintra in significant numbers and have now allied with the Nilfgaard Empire. The Alliance of Northern Kingdoms still faces the threat of annihilation. The meeting room door suddenly bursts open, and when Tissaia sees that it's Yennefer who has entered, tears of joy escape her eyes. She quickly pulls Yennefer aside for a private conversation in her room. Yennefer's fire magic turned the tide in the battle at Sodden Hill, but now it's necessary to attribute this feat to Vilgo to support his political standing within the Brotherhood. And Stregobor's warning isn't just scaremongering. The elven forces led by Francesca have indeed settled in Sintra. They are continuously recruiting elves scattered across the continent. With the protection of the Nilfgaard Empire, this place is undoubtedly the most suitable for elves to thrive. The camera continues to follow Yennefer. Since unleashing the large-scale fire magic at Sodden Hill, she has been unable to reconnect with the chaotic powers. To date, there has been no solution for her recovery. Of course, the other sorceresses are unaware of this. Upon hearing of Yennefer's return, surviving sorceresses like Triss rush to see her. A group of beauties celebrate by taking a bath, but Triss doesn't join them because the flames have left her with unsightly scars, and she's not ready to reveal them in front of everyone. Meanwhile, Stregobor is stirring trouble, smearing the reputation of a noblewoman with elven blood. His aim is to turn the focus against Yennefer, who has one-quarter elven blood, and he claimed that this is to protect the Brotherhood's highest honor. Essentially, he's afraid of Vilgo's faction gaining power and uses such tactics to rally support. On the other hand, the alliance between Fringilla and Francesca in Sintra is solid. Supporting the elves' daily needs is costly, but the Nilfgaard Empire is covering all expenses to demonstrate their sincerity. Fringilla makes a promise to Francesca's unborn child, vowing to help pave the way for a new future for the elves. The scene shifts to the Black Knight from Nilfgaard being imprisoned in the dungeons of Aratuza Academy, subjected to severe torture. Yennefer, not wishing to speak with him, hastily departs, only to be immobilized by Stregobor on her way out. He then proceeds to use a mind-searching spell on her, the same forbidden magic Tissaia had previously attempted on the Black Knight. 
As crucial information is about to be extracted, Tissaia appears and sends Stregobor flying like a used toy. She openly accuses him before the Brotherhood, charging him with treason against Yennefer. But the cunning old man has a backup plan. He raised his suspicion on Yennefer, saying that Yennefer, who survived the fire magic at Sodden Hill, was captured by the Nilfgaardians, escaped, and then was taken by the elves. But she still lives and has returned to the Academy unharmed. He further claimed that everything he did is to protect the Brotherhood after all. With such a grave accusation, everyone remains silent. Stregobor seizes the opportunity to counterattack. To prove her innocence, Yennefer must execute the Black Knight herself. But she refuses to be the executioner and loudly expresses her dissatisfaction to Tisaya. Tisaya offers her another choice, to reveal the truth about her lost powers to Stregobor, showing she poses no threat. There are no other options. Yennefer falls silent. They were heroes of the battle against Nilfgaard, and to return to such indignities suggests that the Brotherhood indeed needs reform. Afterward, Stregobor confronts the fleeing Yennefer. He has spies planted outside. If Yennefer tries to escape, she will be captured and left with no defense. In the evening, the leaders of the Northern Kingdoms gather in the Academy to witness Yennefer's execution of the Black Knight. Tissaia recites an anti-magic incantation to prevent disruptions. After Vilgo's lengthy oration, he hands Yennefer the executioner's axe. She locks eyes with the Black Knight, then strikes with all her might, breaking the shackles on his hands instead. She overturns the torches to create chaos, and seizing the moment, flees on horseback with the Black Knight. The scene shifts to the Northern Alliance cities within the Kingdom of Redania, where elves are still oppressed, and the tyranny of Nilfgaard is continually denounced. Yennefer and the Black Knight find refuge here, but their wanted posters are everywhere, offering a bounty of 40,000. Sensing prying eyes, they quickly hide. It seems that seeking asylum in Sintra is their only option. Meanwhile, the King of Redania is conversing with his ministers. The sorcerer, Dijkstra, promptly eliminates a minister offering poisoned wine. The Northern Kingdoms have united out of hatred for the Elves, but Redania has different priorities, territorial expansion. With Sintra now under Nilfgaard's control, it's an opportune time for Redania to seize more land. Dijkstra quickly devises a plan. Sintra is gathering Elves from all over the continent so they can send an Elf to gather intelligence. There's a suitable candidate in the dungeon, the dark Elf Rat Boy who once traveled with Ciri. In the evening, Yennefer and the Black Knight were preparing to leave by boat when they were ambushed by guards in a narrow alley. Since the Black Knight was weakened by his prolonged imprisonment, he was no match for them. With Yennefer's help, they managed to escape into the sewers, where they encountered some other elves seeking to flee from the same location. After communicating, they decided to proceed together. However, not far from their escape, a dark elf was suddenly dragged underwater by a tentacle. Another elf, the White One, saw this and fled. Yennefer and the Black Knight did their utmost to rescue the Dark Elf, but they were not strong enough to pull him back, and Yennefer nearly lost her own life in the attempt. After escaping, Yennefer was furious. If it weren't for her inability to use magic, they wouldn't be in such a predicament. From just one sentence, the Black Knight deduced that it was fire magic that had taken her powers. Both had experienced glory in their past, and now they were merely in a temporary slump. There was no need for self-pity. While they were talking, they spotted the fleeing white elf and followed him to a secluded spot. They began by scolding this cowardly fellow, and then the leader informed Yennefer that after the performance by the oyster catcher Flutist, they would all leave. Yennefer, upon hearing the singing, smiled knowingly. The so-called oyster catcher Flutist was none other than the bard she hadn't seen in a long time. Upon their reunion, Yennefer hugged the bard so fiercely that he thought she was possessed. It turns out the Bard was helping the Elves smuggle themselves out because he couldn't stand the shameful acts of the Northern Kingdoms. Now they oppress Elves, and later they will turn against Dwarves. Eventually, they will target everyone they consider different, including artists. So why not stand up now and prepare to fight back? The smuggling plan was to set out from a port. The journey had always been smooth, but this time there was a problem. The dock worker, upon seeing the Bard, was grateful as his niece was a fan. They were about to board the ship when the dock worker suddenly pointed out an issue with the lyrics of the bard's signature song. The bard couldn't tolerate this and retorted with a stream of expletives, enraging the worker who then denied him boarding. Seeing their chance of boarding slipping away, the previously cowardly white elf stood up and punched the worker to draw his attention and was then beaten to death by a mob. His sacrifice gave the others the chance to escape. 
After boarding, the Dark Elf thanked the Bard, and it was none other than Rat Boy, the one selected by Dijkstra for the spy mission. After a brief conversation with Yennefer, the Bard left the cabin to pick up the next group of elves. Suddenly, a scream was heard. Yennefer rushed out to investigate and found the Bard's loot discarded on the ground, but the Bard himself had vanished. The scene shifts to a sorceress messenger entering a dimeridium-crafted dungeon. She was there to persuade a male sorcerer named Rienz, who had been imprisoned for owing money to Queen Calanthe of Sintra. Now that the queen was dead, Rienz was still serving his sentence, which seemed somewhat unjust. She was representing the Nilfgaard Emperor, Emir, and sought Rienz's help to capture Ciri. Emir's title echoed throughout the continent, but Rienz was too proud to serve the Emperor. However, the messenger had other terms that could persuade Rienz to act, which would be revealed later. Rewinding time a little bit, Rienz had already set his sights on the Bard while he was singing in a tavern. It was Rienz who had abducted the Bard and made him vanish previously. When Yennefer found out, she hastily disembarked to search for him. The Bard, now imprisoned by Rienz, had thought he was caught by a jealous husband until Rienz snapped his fingers and flames appeared, signaling the gravity of the situation. Yennefer knew she couldn't find the Bard by wandering aimlessly, so she sought information from a prostitute. After confirming that the city's jails didn't hold him, she followed the prostitute's advice to search the tavern for clues. During this time, the Bard had been beaten bloody, but indeed knew nothing of Geralt and Ciri's whereabouts. The only useful clue was about a Witcher fortress that Geralt had mentioned once. Just as the Bard's fingers were about to be scorched by flames, Yennefer arrived in time. Rienz had no qualms about harming women. He released a flame to kill Yennefer, but she countered by spitting alcohol on the flame, turning it back on him and taking the opportunity to rescue the Bard. Seeing that the situation had turned dire, the two decided to split up and flee. Yennefer was led by the prostitute to a house for safety, only to be arrested by soldiers lying in wait, betrayed by the prostitute for money. Meanwhile, the Black Knight had successfully arrived in Sintra by boat. The spy rat boy had also infiltrated the city without raising suspicions. However, the Black Knight was stopped by the guards, with Fringilla arriving just in time to defuse the situation. The duo finally reunited, but Yennefer was not one to sit idly by. Initially, Fringilla and Francesca had both made deals with the Deathless Mother, but Yennefer's story was left untold. Now, to escape, she had no choice but to make a deal with the Deathless Mother, who transported her directly to a cabin in the woods. Yennefer desperately wanted to regain her magical powers, and the Deathless Mother pointed out that the key lay with Ciri. If Yennefer could bring Ciri to her, her wish would be fulfilled. Over at Geralt's side, he used a portal to explain his purpose to Istred immediately upon arrival. However, Istred did not believe that a monster would emerge from the monolith. Geralt wasted no time and threw the head of a centipede monster at his feet, finally convincing him to take the matter seriously. He then led Geralt to the monolith, but they were stopped by the royal guard along the way. Istred presented the researcher ID card given by Fringilla, but the guards were unimpressed and refused them entry into Nilfgaardian territory. Without a second thought, Geralt took action, and Istred also cast a spell to knock one down. It was a clear lesson in actions speak louder than words. After Geralt left, Vesemir proposed to Triss that they use Ciri's blood to create a witcher mutagen that could turn more people into witchers. Ciri was his last hope to ensure the survival of the witchers. Triss hesitated but ultimately decided to respect Ciri's wishes and let her make the decision. On the other side, Geralt had already reached his destination. The scene that unfolded before Istred made him gasp in astonishment. It would take years of erosion to leave even a slight indentation on a starry stone, but the mere fall of the monolith had created such an enormous rift. It was truly inconceivable. While Istred marveled over at the Witcher Refuge, Vesemir had found Ciri and proposed his idea. Ciri did not refuse. She agreed to offer her blood for the creation of a mutagen on one condition. The first batch of the potion must be tested on her. After much internal conflict, Vesemir agreed. Meanwhile, far away, Geralt was still clueless about this development, focusing intently on searching for clues in the ravine. Historians believe that the monoliths are the impact points where different spheres converge. Now, Istred deduced that their thinking was wrong. He believed this place was actually a passage for the convergence of spheres. Back at the Witcher Refuge, after a series of procedures by Triss, a new version of the Witcher mutagen was created. Triss was utterly bewildered upon learning that Ciri would be the first to undergo the new Witcher transformation. She hurried to dissuade Ciri, who wanted to delve into her own past to uncover the truth. 
Using a magic known as the Valley of the Soul, Triss guided Ciri into the deepest layers of her consciousness to access hidden genetic memories. Normally, they would be mere observers, but for some reason, the people in Ciri's memories could see them. The scenes kept changing. A man was planning to flee the palace by boat with young Ciri and her mother. They then arrived in a desolate area and saw a severely wounded female elf holding an infant born of a human father. As expected, this was the protagonist of the story Novellan had told earlier, about the love between an elf and a human. Triss was just about to step forward to help when the elf grabbed her throat and repeated the prophecy about the ancient bloodline that had erupted from Ciri, word for word. Then the sky changed color, and a massive army appeared among the clouds. Ciri was terrified and didn't know what to do. She could only shout Geralt's name. Back to Geralt's side, Istred continued to study the information, speculating that the spheres had not merged but had collided and then separated. The monolith's purpose was to call them closer, and the monsters were from other spheres. As the two conversed, the topic shifted to Yennefer, because Istred was here to find her. It was only then that Geralt learned Yennefer was still alive. But before he could delve deeper, Ciri's cries echoed from the depths of the ravine, followed by a gigantic creature emerging and flying away without paying them any heed. Geralt quickly asked Istred to open a portal to send him back to the Witcher Refuge. At this point, Ciri and Triss had left the realm of memory. Triss was so frightened that she was nearly out of her mind, believing that Ciri would ignite the seed of fire and destroy everyone. Seeing this urgent situation, Ciri wasted no time in finding Vesemir to request the injection of the mutagen. Vesemir was just about to insert the needle into her vein when Geralt arrived in the nick of time, halting the mutation process without explanation. Becoming a Witcher is not something that can be done on a whim. Not to mention the mere 30% success rate, even if one is lucky enough to survive, they would lose the ability to reproduce. Ciri is the sole carrier of the ancient bloodline, so they can't allow this lineage to end with her. Moreover, this incident made Geralt resolve to take Ciri and leave the Witcher refuge. Vesemir was dealing with his own guilt over Geralt's departure when he suddenly felt unwell. Apparently, it's Riance who had come looking for him. Facing this powerful fire sorcerer, Vesemir and Triss together couldn't handle him. In the end, he took the mutagen and left with ease. Emperor Emir's messenger was very pleased with this acquisition, giving Riance the leverage he needed to negotiate terms. He demanded to meet the mastermind behind the scenes, something the messenger would have to discuss with her superiors. However, before that, she could provide Riance with some assistance as a form of interest. Turning back to Geralt and Ciri, the pair set out for the Temple of Melatelli on a single horse. While crossing a river, Geralt suggested using the location to draw out the monster that had flown out of the ravine. Geralt entered the water to engage the monster in combat, but the beast fainted and went straight for Ciri on the shore. Although the trees obstructed its attack, Geralt's beloved horse was left with a massive gash and was beyond saving. In agony, Geralt put an end to its suffering, and his anger reached its peak. He was determined to kill the monster that day as a funeral rite for his horse. Ciri climbed to the highest rock to act as bait. Geralt drank his Witcher potions to enhance his strength, and just as the monster was about to reach Ciri, he leaped out and gutted the creature. Ciri stood her ground until the very last moment because she sensed, just like with the previous monsters, that this one also did not intend to harm her. But what it actually wanted from her was still unknown. The two quickly reached the Temple of Melatelli, renowned for its neutrality. No struggles, no politics. The priestess, an old acquaintance of Geralt's, was there. Ciri could learn much at this place. The priestess first arranged for her to study basic knowledge with the temple's only man, who was clearly smitten with Ciri and tried to flirt with her, only to be shut down by her sharp retorts. At that moment, a familiar face appeared. It's Yennefer, the woman Geralt had been longing for. They met and shared a deep-to-throat kiss without a word. However, Ciri came with questions and interrupted their tongue wrestling. The three of them sat together, the atmosphere warm and cozy. Seeing the unspoken affection between Geralt and Yennefer, Ciri tactfully excused herself to give them some privacy for fishy moments. In the hall, Ciri encountered the priestess lighting candles to honor the dead. Ciri volunteered to light a candle, silently invoking the name of Mousesack, the old man who had died protecting her without ever revealing the secret of her lineage, just as her grandmother, Queen Calanthe, had done. The priestess knew that Ciri's bloodline held infinite power, and with the right guidance, she might be able to change the fate of the continent. 
Meanwhile, Yennefer informed Geralt that a sorcerer using fire magic was investigating him. Geralt instantly realized that Ciri was the target and rushed out of the room to look for the child. Unbeknownst to him, Rience had already come knocking, bringing with him a group of thugs. Ciri had just found the temple's only man knocked out on the ground when she was suddenly surrounded. Seeing Ciri daring to fight his men, Rience launched his fire magic, trapping Ciri within a ring of flames. At the critical moment, Geralt and Yennefer arrived. Geralt instructed Yennefer to take Ciri and flee, leaving him to handle the situation. The burly henchmen might be a match for ordinary people, but they stood no chance against Geralt, lasting barely five minutes. Rientz pursued Ciri and Yennefer, trapping them in a room. The stone door could not withstand the fire magic and was about to melt. Decisively, Yennefer decided to teach Ciri the first lesson she had learned, to cast a spell and open a portal. Geralt dispatched the last henchman, threw out his sword, and scared Ryance away from the door, watching as Yennefer and Ciri stepped through the portal, only then realizing that Yennefer had taken Ciri and outplayed him. Back at the Witcher Refuge, Triss relayed to Vesemir that the mutagen had been stolen, then hurried back to Aratuza Academy to report to Tissaia. A single drop of Ciri's blood could determine the fate of the world. Elsewhere, back at his studio, Istred immediately began to investigate the Sintron royal family tree. Tracing Ciri's lineage upwards, he discovered a very important bloodline that had been hidden. This was intriguing. Istred used his own connections and found the concealed lineage. It was Ciri's ancestor, the gravely wounded elf woman whom Ciri and Triss had encountered in the realm of memory. Her bloodline had the ability to foresee the future and travel through time. The reason Queen Calanthe had hidden her elf lineage was that it concealed a hereditary weapon. Within the kingdom of Sintra that had been conquered by Nilfgaard, the Black Knight had regained his authority, commanding Fringilla to resume her mission to capture Ciri. Coincidentally, Ratboy overheard this as he was passing by. In the palace, Francesca was preparing for the imminent birth of her child, the offspring of her union with Phila Vandrell, with Ciri set to inherit their pure, elven bloodline. However, Sintra was far from peaceful, particularly with the Black Knight's arrival, which Villavandrel sensed brought a subtle shift in the air. The human soldiers, now with a strong backing, began to harbor animosity towards the elves, their equals. Masquerading as a training exercise, the Black Knight swiftly defeated Ratboy in a few moves, attempting to assert dominance. Villavandrel responded by pressing a dagger to his neck. However, the dispute was cut short by Francesca's early labor, and with the assistance of Fringilla and others, a healthy elven baby was joyfully welcomed into the world, bringing smiles and cheers within the palace as Sintra was filled with a jubilant atmosphere, enjoyed even by Fringilla. Yet the Black Knight voiced his concerns, pondering the implications if the elves believed they could prosper independently of Nilfgaard. Leaving a letter from Emperor Emir before Fringilla, he reminded her of her allegiance, a warning watched closely by Ratboy, who relayed everything to the sorcerer Dijkstra through an owl. Through that way, they knew the root of all events was Ciri. On the other side, after Ciri was being taken by Yennefer, the priestess tended to Geralt's wounds. She bluntly stated that Geralt could not provide what Ciri sought, and Yennefer might not mean harm to the child. However, Geralt, having suffered at Yennefer's hand before, was unwilling to trust her again. The scene shifts back to Sintra, where tensions between human and elven forces escalate. With the Nilfgaard Emperor Emir's impending inspection, any discord would spell disaster for all. The Black Knight decided to employ force to subjugate the uncooperative elves, with innocent elven civilians already executed as a grim warning. Francesca and Philavandrel, engrossed in the joy of their newborn, remained indifferent, prompting Fringilla to directly confront them. Philavandrel expressed no interest in conflict with Nilfgaard, emphasizing the importance of their people's growth over warfare now more than ever with a child. Fringilla reminded them of the pact made in the forest cabin. Nilfgaard provided sanctuary for elves who in turn were to fight for Nilfgaard. If the elves sought to withdraw from the war, as Philavandril suggested, Emperor Emir's wrath would be more than they could bear. At Aratuza Academy, Vilgo and Tissaia had become intimate, indicating Tissaia's complete capitulation. The Brotherhood then received an unexpected visitor, the Redanian sorcerer Dijkstra, bringing Ratboy's news of the pure-blooded elven child's birth in Sintra, and also the news that the elven alliance with Nilfgaard posed a significant threat to the northern kingdoms. Tissaia displayed 
distrust in her intelligence network, which Dijkstra did not contest, instead hinting that she had concealed news brought by Triss. Indeed, Triss shared her information only with Tissaia, distrustful of the other members of the Brotherhood. Unexpectedly, Vilgo emerged, forcefully demanding that Tissaia reveal all she knew. Realizing the leak came from Tissaia, Triss angrily departed, while the more enraged Vilgo confronted Tissaia. Fringilla took advantage of a break to sneak back to the Brotherhood and meet with her high-ranking uncle. She revealed her precarious situation and divulged that the alliance between Nilfgaard and the elves was not as solid as it appeared, evidently looking to secure her own future. Ratboy, residing in Sintra, also began to waver after witnessing his kin being persecuted by Nilfgaardian soldiers. He decided to abandon his role as a spy, dedicating himself entirely to protecting the elven people. One evening, the human leaders in Sintra held a banquet, eagerly anticipating Emperor Emir's arrival and discussing the execution of the traitor Fringilla. However, all of a sudden, everyone froze in place. It turned out that Fringilla had drugged their drinks and then brutally murdered the four immobilized leaders. The Black Knight could only watch in horror as this unfolded. Fringilla spared his life so that he could tell Emperor Emir that these four had plotted a rebellion and that she had quelled it. Elsewhere, Dijkstra had become aware of Ratboy's defection. However, he had already obtained the intelligence he needed. He informed the King of Redania that possessing Ciri could legally justify the annexation of Sintra. With multiple powers in search of Ciri, the ensuing chaos could destabilize the entire continent. But the king seemed to dislike Dijkstra's strategic maneuvering, reminding him that he was gambling with his own resources. In another subplot, Rience had already handed over the mutagen to Emperor Emir's messenger, who used Ciri's blood as a catalyst to cast a spell, attempting to track Ciri's location. The result was a disfigurement even more severe than Rience's. The scene shifts to Ciri, who opens a portal and transports herself and Yennefer to a place they both know well, the home that sheltered her during the Battle of Sodden. But upon arrival, they find the family has been brutally murdered, undoubtedly the work of Rience. With Rience's intimate knowledge of her, it's clear he must be connected to Nilfgaard. Ciri is deeply concerned about Geralt and wants to go back to find him. Yennefer suggests that even if Geralt has been captured, Rience wouldn't kill him as he would want to use Geralt as bait to lure Ciri. Therefore, heading straight to Sintra is their best bet. They resolve to set out immediately. Meanwhile, the unlucky bard, while searching for Yennefer, ends up in jail, mistaken for a voyeur. In his cell, his inability to keep quiet, singing and cursing, irritates the guards immensely. Just as one guard steps out for a breath of fresh air, Geralt steps in to free the bard. After many years, the two partners are reunited. However, the bard hasn't forgotten the last time Geralt took his frustrations out on him and holds a grudge. Geralt looks at him earnestly and simply saying he needs his help, manages to win him over. As Ciri and Yennefer continue on their journey, they talk about Geralt. Ciri feels the fatherly love from Geralt that she has never experienced before, which eases the loneliness of her troubled life. The relationship between Yennefer and Geralt is even more complex, but at the end of the day, Yennefer loves Geralt. After being rescued, the bard shares everything he knows with Geralt. Yennefer has lost her magic, and after being caught by the guards, she mentioned words like forest mother and cottage before vanishing into thin air. Geralt immediately understands that Yennefer has sought out the Deathless Mother, a creature that feeds on the pain of those who make deals with it, gaining more power the greater their suffering. Yennefer will most certainly head to where the Deathless Mother resides, in Sintra. With the destination now clear, they set off immediately. On their journey, they encountered the Dwarf Brothers they hadn't seen for a long time, employed by the King to manage the roads and protect caravans. With a caravan present, there was no shortage of horses, and Geralt successfully obtained a new mount. However, Ciri's journey was not going as smoothly. A broken bridge blocked their essential path, and Yennefer guided Ciri to use chaos magic to repair it. Ciri chanted the spell and conjured the magic, but the immense strain caused her eyes to bleed. Despite her efforts, the bridge would not be restored. In her anger, Ciri cursed loudly and upon opening her eyes, found herself and the horse on the other side. This display of power even astonished Yennefer. After crossing, they traveled a bit further and could see the walls of Sintra. 
Siri, looking at the familiar city, felt a deep sense of loss as she knew no one she recognized remained. At that moment, Yennefer felt the frequent call of the deathless mother, but she hesitated to hand Siri over to her. Siri touched Yennefer's arm, sensing her thoughts and becoming filled with rage, unleashing a powerful magic that shattered the walls of Sintra. The guards immediately set out to capture them, and without magic, Yennefer could only watch as Ciri was taken. Fortunately, Geralt arrived in time, and the dwarf brothers accompanying him easily dealt with the guards, quickly ending the battle. Geralt instructed the bard and dwarves to take Ciri back to the Witcher Refuge while he went to deal with the Deathless Mother. Unbeknownst to him, the Deathless Mother had already begun absorbing the pain through Fringilla's killing of four people and Francesca's child's being assassinated that night. This surge of energy was enough to free the Deathless Mother from her confinement. Geralt and Yennefer arrived just in time to witness the Deathless Mother escaping the hut and heading straight for Ciri, possessing her directly. Upon returning to the Witcher Refuge, Ciri fell into an illusion where she saw her mentor and father figure, Mouse Sack, taking her to a royal banquet in Sintra. In reality, Ciri's body was under the control of the Deathless Mother, who with knife in hand killed three Witchers in their sleep. Just as she was about to kill Vesemir, the returning Geralt caught her in the act. Ciri lied, claiming she saw a man in a black robe killing the Witchers, but Geralt immediately saw through her lie. Noticing the bloodstains on her face, he deduced that she was the Deathless Mother. With her plot exposed, the Deathless Mother injured Geralt, who turned and ran away. Vesemir closed the eyes of the dead witchers and drank a vial of witcher's potion, believing that Ciri, like Eskel before her, must be killed to restore peace. However, Geralt disagreed, insisting that they were there to save, not to kill. Ciri needed to save herself and also needed Vesemir's support. Moved by Geralt's words, Vesemir agreed to consider Geralt's battle plan. Elsewhere, devoid of magic, Yennefer couldn't fight head-on and quickly woke the bard to manage logistics. She believed that the parasite possessing Ciri must be removed without killing the host. A spell of extraction or separation should suffice. Yennefer crafted a magical item, providing warmth, energy, and balance. Geralt, now distrustful of her, had no choice but to ask the bard to deliver the item to him. Meanwhile, the possessed Ciri was lost in memories, enjoying the grand banquet of Sintra, surrounded by all the people she missed, including some she once despised. Yet now, she willingly accepted a dance invitation. At that moment, the Deathless Mother, standing in the base hall, was found by the Witchers after they drank their potions. She had been imprisoned by the first Witchers and now sought her revenge. Controlling Ciri, she unleashed a powerful magical force with a piercing scream, preventing the Witchers from getting close. A great tree was shattered, revealing the black starry gemstones hidden within. Fragments of the gemstone shot towards the Witchers. They raised their defenses, but the shards circled back, injuring many, though not fatally. A portal formed from the broken stones, and two lizard-like monsters emerged. Geralt stood still, allowing Vesemir and another Witcher to cast the magic sign to debuff the Deathless Mother. Geralt himself moved in for close combat, trying to use words to awaken the real Ciri. The bard slowly approached from under the table, intending to hand over the magical item. Some Witchers were already overpowered by the monsters, their heads crushed. Vesemir, driven by rage and ignoring his agreement with Geralt, wanted to kill Ciri directly. In a frenzy, Geralt parried the attacks with his sword. Amidst the illusion, Ciri was initially swayed by the call, but as soon as Geralt ceased speaking, the illusion became even more convincing. The climax approached as Ciri's biological parents appeared before her. The control of the deathless mother over Ciri intensified, and seizing the moment, she chanted a spell to summon even more ferocious creatures through the portal. A gigantic lizard monster opened its jaws and knocked Geralt out of the hall, pinning him down with its foot as corrosive saliva flowed, wounding him. Geralt used a sign to blind the monster, taking advantage of its pain to drive his sword through its head, sending it crashing down the castle. Inside the building, as the Deathless Mother continued her incantations, the enraged Vesemir used a dagger to stab her in the lower abdomen, but not her smelly part. However, this minor injury was easily healed by the Deathless Mother. Geralt quickly intervened to stop Vesemir from further action. The remaining Witchers finally dealt with the two creatures, their anger magnified by the sight of their fallen comrades. The Deathless Mother taunted them, remarking that Witchers were supposed to be emotionless, yet now they harbored hatred, a sentiment that perfectly served as nourishment for her, making her stronger. The Bard, with every ounce of his strength, finally managed to toss the magical item near Geralt, urging everyone to regain their composure. 
He then called out for Siri to come back quickly. However, in the memory world, Siri had just entered her mother's embrace and was oblivious to Geralt's calls. Even as she distinctly heard everyone's voices, her final response was still that she would not go anywhere. The Deathless Mother's cabin was destroyed. She needed a vessel to remain in this world, which is why she wouldn't leave Siri's body. Upon hearing this, Yennefer decisively smashed a vial and cut her wrist to let the fresh blood flow out. Apparently, she intended to make herself the vessel. This action shocked the Deathless Mother, and the memory world that had entrapped Ciri began to collapse. The last to disappear were Ciri's parents. After the memory collapse, Ciri finally returned to the real world, and the Deathless Mother entered Yennefer's body. At this moment, Ciri awoke and was finally able to break the spell. She harnessed the power of her ancient blood to open the monolith portal, transporting herself, Geralt, and Yennefer to another sphere. The Deathless Mother immediately left Yennefer's body, and landing on a distant warhorse, she took on the appearance of a knight. She then shouted for Ciri, the child of the ancient blood, to join their wild hunt army and charged at them with her soldiers. In the nick of time, Ciri activated her powers and the three of them returned to the Witcher Refuge. The Deathless Mother was finally dealt with and Yennefer, who was willing to sacrifice herself, was rewarded with the restoration of her magic. After this battle, the Witchers suffered heavy losses, but their troubles were far from over. Tissaia disclosed to the kings of the Northern Kingdoms that Ciri, the Princess of Sintra, was still alive. To prevent anyone from capturing Ciri to claim Sintra's legitimate succession rights, the kings unanimously decided to put a bounty on her life and the life of anyone protecting her. In Sintra, Ratboy confessed to Philavandril his identity as a spy, but he was now out of Dijkstra's control. He speculated that the death of the elf child was the work of Redanian forces, which belonged to Dijkstra. Francesca was now only set on vengeance, and she intended to move against Redania. Led by Francesca and the elves' prophetess, a large group of elves left Sintra to pursue the murderers of their child in Redania, catching the attention of Fringilla. The Black Knight immediately realized this was an opportunity. If he and Fringilla could manipulate the entire situation, letting Francesca be blinded by hatred over her child's death to raise the enemy land of Nilfgaard to the ground, Emperor Emhir would surely take notice of them. The scene shifts to the Redania Kingdom, where all the children in the city have been marked with curses, the work of Francesca's magic cast upon them. As the last curse is sealed with her raised and then lowered hands, the cries of countless children abruptly stop, followed by the desperate screams of the adults. Francesca's wish is no longer for the elves to thrive, but to declare outright war against humanity. They had captured Istred, who also decided to pursue Ciri, as her ancient blood could revitalize the elven race. An owl, perched not far away, observed all of this. This owl, once a messenger for Ratboy, was unknown to him by name. It was a loyal servant of Dijkstra. Finally, the scene moves to Sintra. The Nilfgaard Emperor Emir has arrived. Following the Black Knight's lead, Fringilla took credit for forcing the elves into battle with the Northern Kingdoms by attributing to them the murder of Francesca's child. Unbeknownst to them, the order to kill the elven babies had come from Emperor Emhir himself. Because of that, Fringilla and the Black Knight were taken into custody for their deceit, and Emperor Emir finally revealed his true identity. He was, shockingly, Ciri's father. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.